Hello. Welcome to the webinar. We'll go ahead and get started around one o'clock, but if you want to go ahead and pop in the chat box, what's blooming at your house, I'd love to hear, or what's blooming in your demonstration garden or um, <clears throat> any place where you happen to um, care, care for plants. Um, and you can also say what county you're from. And I am going to join you and I am in Alachua County and my Turk's cap is putting on quite a show. And Cindy's here from Sarasota. Becky's from Leon. Sarasota's here. Leon. Ida says the weeds are blooming at her house. Fire Spike is blooming in Duval. Hillsborough County. Lauren is here. Um, Pasco says, Tracy says the camellias are blooming. That's wonderful. Um, Yolanda's from Osceola County. Osceola County, she's here. Bay County is with us. And uh, Palm Beach is with us. And in Miami Dade, the Panama Rose is blooming. That's wonderful. Leon County again. Let's see who else is here. What's blooming out there? Um, Phil from Indian River. Uh, Orange County is here. Polk County. Camellias are blooming in Escambia. And Teresa's here from Alachua. Asters are blooming for Cindy in Sarasota. Uh, Becky says, uh, Bulbines, poinsettia, angel's trumpet, bougainvillea. Strawberries are peeking through for Lauren. Awesome. Panama rose and Orlando. Camellia shrimp plant. Um, Hong Kong orchid, hibiscus as always. Oh, Yvonne's got yesterday, today, and tomorrow blooming. That's wonderful. Sometimes it is a short day plant, so that's good to see. Hillsboro, orange, snap peas are blooming, loquats are blooming. What a wonderful fragrance. Roses are happy with the cooler weather. They're blooming. Loquats are blooming other ways. Uh, Palm Beach says yesterday, today, and tomorrow's blooming. All right. We've got a lot of folks joining us today. Um, and I'm excited to be with you for the last webinar of 2023. I can't believe the year is closing to an end. That is, uh, it's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? So I'm going to go ahead and um, forward our slide. And remember for the webinar that <clears throat> if the chat box is getting distraction distracting to you, you can go ahead and um, just minimize it. And I will be monitoring the chat box as well as the question and answer box. So I'm excited uh, to do that with you. And I'm also excited to announce our webinars for 2024. So we will be doing this event again, uh, usually that uh, fourth Thursday of the month. Uh, we've got some great topics coming through. We are going to have um, <clears throat> ear leaf acacia and invasives next Jan or next month in January. On February, Larry Williams is going to present to us success with tomatoes. He does a great tomato talk. Then in March, Brian Unruh is going to talk to us about turf as well as the new soil testing um, procedures. Then in April, Ryan Klein is going to talk to us about planting trees and maintaining trees. Then in May, we're going to have a, a talk on climate change, which is going to be very interesting. June, we're going to learn about beneficial insects and IPM successes from Adam Dale. July, we're going to have um, uh, Kelly talk to us about perennial peanut. And then in August, I have a surprise for you. And what does surprise mean? It means that I haven't confirmed that speaker yet, but we, I got nine months. I'm sure I'm going to lock it down. In uh, September, during hurricane season, we're going to talk about um, Stephen Brown from Lee County is going to share with us what plants survived Hurricane Ian out on um, Fort Myers Beach and Sanibel. So that's going to be fascinating. Then Billy Crow is going to talk to us in October about nematodes. Um, and then November 4th, we're going to hear from Amy Vu, the honeybee lab uh, extension person. She's going to talk about um, honeybees, what master gardeners need to know about those. And then a year from today or two days ago, I'm going to talk about some of the master gardener projects from across the state that are just, you know, really showstoppers. So um, those are those are our webinars. When you um, you will get a follow up email from this webinar today. And that's going to include all the titles and your ability to register. OK, so you can register and you'll get a couple of the opportunities to register for the webinars for 2024 also.
<clears throat> so um, let's see, your presenter for today is me. Um, I am going to be talking about pass along plants. So that is going to be a lot of fun. Um, I, this is a picture of me at Bouchard Gardens and I just love uh, beautiful plants. And, um, and that's me with the, my clippers in the hand, my hand. I enjoy also uh, clipping plants from time to time. So I wonder if you do too. Um, and uh, Becky put the webinar schedule into the chat um, and the link. So you can go check those out there. So this is me clipping um, Alternanthera in my garden. And that's one of the plants that I like to share, even though it's um, we have to worry about um, some of these plants sometimes. But that's something that I had shared in the past. OK, so we're going to talk about um, pass along plants today. And pass along plants are um, those plants that you share with others and uh, one of the great pleasures of gardening is sharing information that we share, um, but we also love to share plants too. And it's one of the best things that you can do is when you share plants, you also share information and you share a little part of your garden with your friends and family. Um, and it's a great way to make new friends too. I'm very um, prone to sharing with neighbors or people who are walking their dog out in front of me. And it's great to, uh, to share plants and you get to meet people and you get to ask, check in with them later to see how those plants are doing. And pass along plants has been somewhat of a Southern tradition. These are easily propagated plants. Oftentimes these are plants that are unavailable in nurseries. And um, so the only way that they can be spread or shared is from gardener to gardener and passed along to other friends. And a lot of times, each plant holds a little story with it. And uh, so you share the plant, you share the story and you make the connection. So this is great. So this is um, this is a red hot poker. This is one of my stories that a friend of mine from South Carolina shared with me. And every time I see this plant, I think about him and I think about the story that goes with the plant. So that is um, that is fun. And uh, there's a lot of old varieties out there um, and heirloom vegetables that are difficult to share or difficult to find in retail settings. So the first, um, the first plant that I have really had a pass along from was Roselle. There was no way I was finding Roselle in the store. This was 20, 25 years ago and someone gave me seeds I planted the seeds, the roselle grew. I enjoyed the roselle, but I always saved my own seeds for the next year, replanted, and then I had roselle, and then I was able to share roselle seeds as well. I bet a lot of you um, have done that as well. If you are interested in passing your own plants along, the general rule is that you divide the plants the opposite season that they bloom. So if a daylily is blooming in the spring, the best time to divide it is in the fall. If it's a fall bloomer, the best time to divide it is in the spring, okay? If it's a deep summer bloomer, you may wanna divide it in the winter. So, and a lot of times it doesn't mean, um, you don't always have to do it that way. Sometimes you just do it when it's, um, when you happen to be there with a friend standing and you have a trowel in your hand, but the for ideally we do it opposite their bloom time. Okay. You want to save your seeds as they mature and you can poke plant cuttings, propagate all throughout the years to pass along to your favorite gardeners. Um, this plant that I have here is uh, Jatropha multifida. And this is a plant that master gardeners, Peter and um, Deborah Weiss uh, from Levy County shared with me. And this is a this is their plant going strong. So thank you, Peter. And thank you, Deborah, for sharing this plant with me a couple of years back. So I'm going to go through some of our favorite pass along plants and you are welcome to jump in the chat um, as we get closer to the end and talk about the ones that you like to share too. 
Um, and I'm going to go ahead and get started with a great one to go with right off the bat. Daylilies, uh, Americalis, uh, there are different species. They do great in full sun to partial shade. They prefer well-drained soils. They'll grow through all the zones throughout Florida. And the best time to divide them is in the fall, September, October. And they do best with um, divisions. You can save seeds and grow seedlings, but um, the best way to do it is to make sure that you have um, got that nice fan, a vegetative fan that includes not only leaves, but it also includes a healthy um, part of roots, okay? I wanna remind you that collecting flowers on the roadside is not legal. Um, so please don't do that. I know probably there's plenty of you out there right now with a trowel and a bag in your car, but we wanna make sure that we're not collecting from roadsides. I have my first start of daylilies I got was from a master gardener. And I ultimately asked her where she got them. And she said she dug them up on the roadside in South Carolina. And I said, Jenny, please don't do <laughs> Jenny, please don't do that. But I do have them in my yard now and I share them as well. The next one I want to talk about is crinum lilies. Crinum Americanum is a native crinum lily that we have. They do best in full to partial shade. They like well-drained soils, except for the Crinum Americanum. That is a wetland plant, so that does great in very moist areas or next to a pond or a, nest, an, an, a rain garden would be a great spot for these as well. And the one I have pictured here is Crinum Augustum, and that is Queen Emma. And Queen Emma can get as tall as 10 feet tall and beautiful blooms throughout the season, gorgeous. There's so many different crinums to choose from. If you're interested in crinums, there are whole books written on crinums, so I would encourage you to check that out. They share best with bulbs, so opposite bloom time, you will dig up a giant bulb. Those bulbs can weigh as much as 20 pounds, so uh, be prepared to get a big bulb if you're excited about that. Another lily that we don't often see in retail settings, but friends love to share with us is the blood lily. Hemanthus multiflorus. This means blood flower with many flowers. It does beautifully in partial shade, wants well-drained soil. It grows in um, zone eight through 11, and we share these with bulbs. You know, blood, blood lilies are just gorgeous. The foliage is beautiful, as you can see from the center photo. But when you get that ball of red flowers showing up, it is fantastic. I would encourage you, if you have a friend that's growing blood lily, to get a few of those. Another lily that I'm hugely fond of is the hurricane lily, the Lycoris. One of the things that's great about these is that they are a surprise. And they bloom in September during the height of our hurricane season. That's why we call them those. They're also called surprise lilies. One of my neighbors has them in yellow, which is the photo that I took over there to the left. And the standard color are the red spidery ones that are over on the right. As you can see, the foliage is basically non-existent. And then the flower pops up and in September and it's a beautiful surprise. I wanted to do this talk for you all on pass along plants for Florida because there are a lot of pass along plants out there in the United States, but I have to say we are kind of unique in some of the tropical and really cool plants that we can grow. And one of the ones that I know is a great pass along plant is the pine cone ginger, Zingiber zerumbet. You know, also know this as shampoo ginger. They bloom beautifully in the fall. The red that you see there are bracts, and the ginger flowers are deep inside. You share these by rhizomes. They do perfectly well in the shade. They probably grow sometimes between three and five feet tall, sometimes a little bit smaller. Moist soil, well-drained soil, and you share by rhizomes or divisions. And if I'm sure this has happened to you, you're in a garden with someone, you say, oh, I love that pine cone ginger, and your friend, the gardener, 
bends over, rips up a piece and hands you the root, and then you're off to the races. I have seen variegated pine cone ginger with the leaves with a beautiful little white margin and line on it. And a friend of mine has those and I have requested a pass along plant from him. So hopefully I'll have some of those to share in the future with my friends. And remember, we can grow a lot of other gingers too. We can grow the shell ginger, the alpinia, the butterfly ginger like the hedicium, the spiral ginger like the costus, these are so easy to share. You can share with rhizomes and the costa lily or costus lily or costus ginger are very easy to share just by stem cuttings. You break the stem um, and then put some root tone on the, on the um, cut and then they root from the stem cutting very easily as well. So I think we're blessed to live in Florida to have all these tropical plants that we can grow as pass along plants. And speaking of tropical plants, one of my favorite species is Heliconias. There's many, many different species of Heliconia. They can be very tall. They can be very short, like the uh, Heliconia psittacorum over there on the far left. If anyone recognizes that bench, that's from the Discovery Gardens. That's down in Lake County in Tavares. And they can grow well in the full to partial shade. They like well-drained to moist soils, and they are going to perform best in 10A to 11. And we share with divisions um, for the heliconias. And so we have heliconias that hold their flowers upright. And then we have heliconias that have flowers that nod. And then there's heliconias that have a kind of an in-between way that they hold their inflorescence. But heliconias are just a fantastic, uh, beautiful tropical plant that are very easy to share. Another tropical that's fabulous to share are bromeliads. And if you have been in a garden with a master gardener who is growing a ton of bromeliads, they will also just rip off pups and hand them to you. And I, I'm a fan of the neoregilias here, um, the one on the left, as well as the one in the middle. And then there's some acmeas in the back um, blooming there as well. They are going to perform best in partial shade, well-drained soil, somewhat dry soil. And re because remember that they're an air plant and they um, don't need to have very wet feet, okay, at all. And once a bromeliad flowers, it is monocarpic, meaning that it flowers once and it shoots out pups. Usually it shoots out two or three. And so you have plenty to share as they go along. Now, old garden roses, we had a talk back in October about all old garden roses. Matt, um, um, Matt Orwat came and shared with us about those. But this is a plant that master gardeners and other gardeners like to share as well. The one on the right is one called Carefree Beauty. And I wanna tell you a story about this rose. <clears throat> I have a friend who lives down in the Keys and Susie Nullman is her name. And she was close with my mother and my mother shared this rose with her. My mom has passed away now probably 11 or 12 years. And Susie called me about a year ago and said, hey, do you want your mother's rose? And I couldn't remember what rose she was talking about. My mom had a number of roses and I couldn't remember. And she said, you know, it's the pink one that'll grow anywhere. I'm like, really? She said, yeah, I've made a cutting for you. I'm going to bring it to Gainesville so you can have it. And this is a picture of that rose that's growing in my yard on the right there. I had some rosarians identify it for me as carefree beauty. And it's like having a part of my mom's garden back in my yard because plants can be very sentimental and nostalgic. And this is a way to kind of keep the memory of someone alive with a pass along plant that you can be able to share. Now the rose on the left hand side is um, a Peggy Martin rose. And this is from a photo from the LSU um, gardens in Baton Rouge. Peggy Martin uh, was, uh, the rose was named for an avid Louisiana gardener whose home and property stood under 20 feet of salt water during Hurricane Katrina. And it is a tough, tough rose. It's a beautiful rose. And Peggy Martin decided to go ahead and share this rose and this special story. So this rose is also called the Katrina Rose. 
And my Peggy Martin rose was shared with me from um, a master gardener named Lois McNamara here in Gainesville. So that was a way to tell the story, to share the, the beautiful plant and to kind of keep on the, the tradition of sharing old garden roses. Another plant I want to talk about as far as being a great pass along is the English dogwood or the mock orange. Philadelphus coronaris is known as the mock orange because the blooms almost look like a citrus flower. It's quite stunning when it's all in bloom. And we do actually have a native one. It's called Philadelphus indorus. And Indoros means no smell, but that native mock orange actually has a fabulous fragrance to it. This is a rangy shrub. It gets five to six feet tall and then kind of flops over on itself and it blooms in early spring and it gets covered with these gorgeous white flowers that have a lovely fragrance. And why I really like this plant is because you get these beautiful blooms in partial shade. Um, a lot of times, once they get established, they do not need a lot of supplemental watering, and you share these by root suckers. So that's a neat way to, to share those. So if you're wanting to really focus on natives, this is a neat one that you could put into your garden. <clears throat> Alan asks, is this a dogwood's dying uh, because of the diseases in the north? No, actually, this is not a dogwood. And it's not an orange, so I don't know why they call it either one of those in the common name. The uh, Cornus florida is the plant that is being affected by uh, anthracnose disease farther north. So that's that that's a true dogwood that's being affected. This is just a tough little guy that's not bothered by pest, disease, drought, any any issues whatsoever. So I would highly recommend this one. Next up to talk about sharing is the frangipani or the plumeria. And I love the picture of the in the middle here of these sticks, right? We buy these little stem cuttings. You might buy them at a flea market or um, at a plant sale and then you root them and you get a beautiful plant with fabulous, gorgeous tropical flowers that smell like, uh, well, they smell fabulous. They smell like vacation to me. And I do want to remind you that even though you buy this cute little stick, this plant wants to be a pretty big tree, especially in South Florida. So it's not just a it's not just a little plant. It's a commitment in your landscape. So before you buy that cute little stick for a few dollars, know where you're going to put it. And I have friends who are in the Plumeria Society in the Panhandle, and they have all the different colors: white, yellow, red, pink, orange. Um, so. There's a lot to learn about plumeria. It's easy to get addicted and exciting to share these because all you have to do is break off a stick, pop it in the ground. Now they do best in zones 10A down to 11. If you grow them further north and nine and above, nine or eight, know that you're gonna have to protect them from the frost, okay? They're not gonna be a big tree for you. They're gonna be a potted plant that you have to do the tropical plant shuffle and run them in and out uh, of a protected greenhouse or a protected area. So before you accept these, make sure that you know what you're getting into or that you live in South Florida and you can plant them with no problem. Irises are a great pass along plant because they are so easy to share. They usually bloom in the spring. Um, we have our African iris, the Dietes aridoides. And we have our Iris Virginia, which is our Florida native that wants to be in the wet soil. The African Iris wants to be in very dry soil. And then we have the Neomarchia also who, that wants to be kind of in between, a little slightly moist and well-drained. Irises can grow in from full to par, partial shade. They bloom much better in the full sun than they do in the shade. And they're gonna grow from 8B to 10B, so basically the whole state. And you can divide them by dividing the fans or what a lot of them do, they call them walking iris because they, they bloom off of that one scape and then they lay down and then that roots. So there's little plantlets. I call them nodding plantlets. So it's very easy to chop those off and um, they come with roots. You pop those up and you give them to friends and you're able to sh share these gorgeous blooms with them.
Another strap-like plant that's easy to share is Crocosmia. And it's also known as Monbretia. Um, Lucifer is the variety off to the left that's bright red, has a lot of grassy-like foliage. The foliage is two to three feet tall. And then later in the spring, you get these beautiful sprays of orange and red flowers. And they're easy to share with divisions. They want to grow in well-drained soils. And you're going to see these doing best in zone eight and nine. Now, I love a beautiful angel's trumpet. And these are usually shared with rooted cuttings. Remember that all parts of this plant are toxic. So we're not eating this when we're sharing it. We're making sure that any pets are avoiding it also. They come in a variety of colors. This is our Brugmansia, and they're going to do best in partial shade. They really like a break from the late afternoon sun. They're going to do best in zones 9 through 11, although this one here on the right is uh, growing probably in 9. Yes, it's probably growing in 9B. And that is a Charles Grimaldi, the one off to the right. And this is a fun story. So Mary Glazers is a master gardener. I've been a master gardener in um, in Alachua County. She had this beautiful flower. She wanted to get it more specifically identified. She brought it to Mark Frank, the extension botanist. He identified the, the exact cultivar for her and he took a cutting. And then I mentioned to Mark, I needed a cutting. So I got a cutting of Mary's through Mark and now I'm growing it and I have beautiful blooms as well. This one is fragrant that Charles Grimaldi has a beautiful um, smell to it. Okay, Becky says the, size says, the slide says full to partial shade. Does that mean full shade or full sun? Well, in this one it means, on the last one it meant full sun to partial shade. So it can either grow in the full sun or partial shade. This one says partial shade, so that's partial shade only. Easy for me to say. Okay, after Angel's Trumpet, we have our passion vine, Passiflora incarnata. And this one is a native for us, also known as Maypops. We get the gorgeous Passiflora flower, and this will grow in full sun. It will also grow in partial shade. They like well-drained soils. It's a vine, so it needs to climb on something, and it loves to send up root suckers. So some gardeners complain about the root suckers. I dig them up and put them in pots to share or move the plant around my garden. And remember that this is a fabulous host plant for a number of butterflies, the zebra longwing, our state butterfly, as well as the gulf fritillary, as well as the variegated fritillary. So this is a wonderful addition to your butterfly garden. And then you can have the root suckers that come up, you can dig those and share with your friends. So this is a nice native to share as well. What an old timey plant to share, four o'clocks, Mirabilis jalapa. Um, these are a flower that was originally grown in Peru. Did you know that these flowers were grown by Thomas Jefferson at Monticello? And actually Monticello still sells seeds from those original plants. So that's a really cool, fun fact. This is my grandma's flowers. Um, you know, they have uh, been around for a long time. Thomas Jefferson uh, brought them in. So this is considered old fashioned, but I like to think what old is what's old is new again. Beautiful colors, there's peach, there's yellow, there's hot pink. Some of them have hot pink flowers and lime green leaves or variegated leaves. So you can find some really cool, beautiful flowers um, forms. Full sun, they can grow in the full sun. They can grow in the partial shade, they're gonna bloom. Why do we call them four o'clocks? Because the blooms open at the end of the day, four or five o'clock and really cool pollinators come to them, including the hummingbird moth or a sphinx moth will come in the late afternoon and pollinate these. Following the flowers come a little black pea seed, which is extremely easy to share, germinate, and um, have a, bring out new plants uh, in your garden. Also, when they die back to the ground, when they get cold, are they have a very large tuber and if you've ever dug these tubers, you're like, oh my gosh, this tuber is so huge and the plant is even, even that big. 
So you will um, enjoy four o'clocks and they're so easy to share. And Janet says they're so fragrant and they are, they are fabulously fragrant. Thank you for reminding me of that. And <clears throat> this is funny. Um, my sister grew these in when she lived in Safety Harbor, Florida. And she said, I said, oh, I love your four o'clocks. And she said, yeah, mom gave me the seeds for those. Aren't they beautiful? And she was kind of saying, you know, like mom gave me the seeds and she didn't give them to you. And I said, oh, really? Because I gave them to mom and mom gave you, gave you then gave them to you. So we kind of had a little sibling rivalry of who gave mom the seeds first. So that was kind of fun. We're over it now. We've worked through it. A very cool pass along plant is the Everglades tomato, Solanum pimpinifolium. And these are really amazing little tomatoes that don't stop producing. They're ever bearing. They're tiny, as you can see from the ruler there. They're about, uh, let's see, half of a centimeter big. And they pack such a sweet punch of, of flavor and they're so prolific. So I really appreciate the Everglades tomato. For the longest time, you could not get seed anywhere. Sometimes you can get seed, but this is something where people will save the seeds from this and then share it along. They want to grow in the full sun, the partial shade. They want well-drained soils. They'll grow throughout the whole state. And you can give people seeds or you can germinate the seeds and then give them seedlings. A lot of times for me, these are volunteers in the compost pile, so they could be dug out of the compost pile and shared. Um, this is definitely an uh, indeterminate tomato. <laughs> and anybody, Camille said, is this a determinate, indeterminate tomato? Absolutely indeterminate. It can make a huge, it doesn't stop growing, a huge bush. And in fact, on the farm where I grew up, we had a giant uh, compost pile and we had volunteers and the compost pile was about five feet wide and about four feet tall in a circle and it kept on growing and growing and it almost became like a compost uh, cage the compost cage became the support for this giant tomato and Rebecca says you can find the seeds on Etsy so that's a hot tip thank you Rebecca and another edible is lemongrass Lemongrass is very easy to share with divisions. You just dig down and pull out a, a nice clump from your main clump. These are gonna perform best in full sun. That's where I find them best. They will grow in partial shade. They want well-drained soils and they're very tropical growing in our 10A to 11, but they can come up as far as um, zone nine without any problem. A lot of times they die down and then come back from the roots. And the fragrance of these leaves are marvelous. You can make lemongrass tea from the leaves. You can use the um, thick part of the stem in um, different types of cooking for soups or sauces. Lemongrass really definitely deserves a place in your garden. And the best place to get a lemongrass plant is from a friend that will share with you. <clears throat> Cindy wants me to tell you, before you use lemongrass internally, do not use them if you have a thyroid issue. Okay, thank you, Cindy. Now moving on a little bit to the house plants. For me, Hoya is an easy, easy plant to share. Hoyas are drought tolerant and abuse tolerant. Ask me how I know because I occasionally abuse these plants. For very healthy and long-lived plants, they will produce gorgeous clusters of waxy, waxy flowers that have a lovely fragrance. They do best for me in partial shade. They like to have dry soil. You can overwater them, so try not to do that. You're going to grow them indoors or protected outdoors. They do fantastic in hanging baskets. And every once in a while, a Hoyle will put out this wild stem and it almost has little roots ready to go. So it, it's saying, propagate me, share me with a friend. A lot of different cultivars out there. So try to know what you have and give someone the full information when you share it. Carol says she lives in Brooksville and her um, lemongrass plants are huge. Okay, so 
When we go to Hernando County, we know to look for lemongrass from Carol. That's good. But Hoyas are great. I really enjoy um, growing those and sharing those. Now, another plant that is a hanging basket plant that is great is orchid cactus, Epiphyllum oxypetalum. And I'm just going to take a quick poll. How many of you all are growing this and you got it from another master gardener? So in the chat, give me a thumbs up or a, a yes, I am if you are growing this and you got it from a master gardener. So yes, Amanda got hers from her mom, right? And these are, it's almost like a white elephant because it grows and grows and it's got these long strappy leaves and you're like, oh, why am I even dealing with this plant? I don't know if I really like it. And then the beautiful bloom comes and it makes it all worthwhile. Um, they bloom from the, we call them leaves, but they're actually clay dodes. It's kind of a leaf-like structure. And then the flower actually comes out of the side of the leaf and it gives you this spectacular cactus-like bloom. And the stems can reach as long as 20 feet long. So it can be a huge uh, floppy plant. Most of the time, they're only about three to four feet long and they look great coming out of a hibis, uh, um, hanging basket. And what you do is you cut those clay dons and you can actually um, cut root them from half of a leaf. Okay, Robert got his from another master gardener. Cindy says the smell of the blooms is amazing. Um, Janice says they bloom at night and they don't last very long. No, you got, if you want to put this on Instagram or Facebook, you got to take the picture that night. Don't, it's not going to bloom tomorrow. Uh, Peg Egg got hers at a plant swap. And let's see. Um, well, Alan, uh, Peggy Eggleston in Hillsboro does have one. So she may share with you. And Debbie asked a good question. Is that related to night blooming cirrus? And the answer is it's in a different genus. And thank goodness, because night blooming cirrus is actually on the invasive plant list. So this one is not the invasive form. Uh, we definitely want to uh, grow plants that are not invasive. Okay, the next one up I have for you is agave. And Agave Americanum is native to Texas, not to Florida. This is our century plant. They call it, they, when I was a kid, they said, okay, it's a century plant because it takes a century to bloom, but no, they bloom a lot quicker than that. A few, five, five, 10 years, you'll get a nice bloom spike. There's a lot of different forms of agave. Make sure that you know which one you're getting. There is an invasive species out there, but agave americanum is not invasive. Agave desmetiana is not invasive either. And these are super tough. They want to be in dry soil, full baking sun, and they make either side pups. They'll shoot out vegetatively from the side or when that century flower comes, when that beautiful flower spike comes, there will be little plantlets up at the top and you can make plant cuttings out of that. And this is my agave uh, desmetiana and I will attest to how tough it is because it's at the end of my driveway and when my daughter was learning how to drive, she ran over it probably about every five days that <laughs> she backed out the driveway. This poor plant has been hit. But as it got damaged, it was like, oh, they're trying to kill me. So I put out a lot of pups that I've been able to share over the years. Um, <clears throat> Joe Gross says, um, do they die after blooming? Yes, they do. And that's why they put to agave Americanas will die after blooming. And also the Desmetianas will too. Um, they will put out the side shoots. The mother dies, but you get plenty of side shoots to, to keep growing. And Camille says, can one make tequila from these agaves? No, there's a special uh, tequila agave um, that is, you know, that's the one where the core, where they can go ahead and make the alcohol from, but neither one of these is. All right, next up is aloe. Uh, this is, uh, the one on the left is aloe saponaria, the soap aloe, but of course aloe vera is very easy to share. And there's a number of aloes out there that put out side shoots. I grow one called hedgehog that I think is just adorable and it has little yellow flowers. But the saponera is probably the easiest one to share. It has been given to me in a Publix plastic bag on a number of occasions and I just keep putting it out there. I do love it because it's so tough. 
full full sun will actually bloom in a little bit of partial shade as well. Likes to have very dry soil in zones eight to 11. So it will grow throughout the whole state. And we get those beautiful little coral flowers in the fall and the hummingbirds are just mad about them. So this is a very beautiful little plant to pass along and, and the hummingbirds and other wildlife appreciate it too. And then I had to include this little pot that says you had me at aloe. So it's cute. A plant that's been shared with me a number of times is devil's backbone. Now, that's not a great common name because there's a number of plants called devil's backbone, but the one I'm referring to is Euphorbia thithymaloides. It also could also has been known by the name Petalanthus thithymaloides. These grow in partial shade, well-drained soils, and they have a rickrack to it. They have a zigzag on the stem, and it's a great little euphorb. A lot of times people share them with rooted cuttings. They do great um, indoor, makes a neat indoor plant or a porch plant as well. And speaking of kind of succulent type plants, succulents are super easy to share. A lot of times you can make little plantlets right off of the leaves. As the leaves drop, they make little plantlets. So that's easy. I love that pencil cactus off to the left. I've grown that. That is, you, we don't want to eat that. It's toxic. And then the stapelia uh, or the starfish um, cactus is easy to share as well. Full sun for both of these. We want, they want to be in dry soil, sandy soil. And you can share with leaves that have a little propagul to it or with rooted cuttings. Those succulents are great fun to share as well. And for tropicals, I love the um, staghorn fern, platycerum bifurcatum. The way we share these is with the basal frond. So it has two types of frond. It has the foliar frond and it has the basal frond that sticks onto a hanging basket or a piece of wood or however you just choose to mount or display these. But as the plant multiplies, it produces a lot more of these basal fronds. Carefully with your knife, um, I use a bread knife um, and sometimes it belongs in the kitchen and it's actually on the potting shed, but you can carefully remove the basal frond if you have plenty and then there's enough rooted material on the back side of that that you can mount it or putting it put it into a hanging basket and share with a friend. And the, the one on the left there is kind of, I'm sure a lot of you know, giant staghorn ferns that are growing throughout Florida. So it's really easy to share those. But the they become um, um, hard to deal with after a while. What am I going to do with this giant staghorn? So remember, it's a lifelong commitment to grow something of that size. There was a, yes, yeah, Cindy, the, the staghorns are on the caution list and I have it marked down here. So that's why we're going to grow these indoors. And so they're caution in South Florida. And definitely when you are doing a presentation, you definitely want to mention that they are on the caution list. But many times people are growing these as an interior or a porch plant also. And when you see a staghorn that has these brown patches on the leaves those are on the underside and you can look at those and know that those are the um, spores that spread <laughs> yes i was very happy that it went from uh, uh red uh red invasion risk back to caution which is appropriate now i have to you know i like st funny stuff so i have to show you this we see the darndest things on the internet don't you? Sometimes when people think, oh, you can plant a banana and it will grow in the soil. There's just a lot of wrong information out there. But I will tell you that bananas are very easy to share. Once you get a nice stand of bananas, they put up what I call ehos or little suns on the side or pups. And so they want to grow in full sun. They want to be in well-drained to slightly moist soils. They're going to grow reliable in nine to, from 9A down to 11. And you want to share with the strong pups. And I want to mention this because a lot of times bananas will put up what we call water suckers, kind of these little weak little plants underneath the, um, underneath the mother plant. But what you want to look for is a very strong, thick sucker coming up very close to the mother trunk. 
And remember also that bananas are monocarpic. So once they produce that gorgeous head of bananas, that mother plant is going to diminish and die and put all the strength to the side shoots or to the suckers. Okay. And the last few I have to share with you are annuals. I love Cosmos. Uh, Cosmos sulfurous is a beautiful plant, actually native to uh, Mexico, but does very well here in Florida. It grows a full cycle and then puts on seeds and then dies down. You save the seeds, you plant them for the next spring, and you get gorgeous Cosmos again. And I have our little seed packets. I hope you all got to see the seed packet in the newsletter that is mailed out, the Neighborhood Gardener. It's, if you didn't get it, it's also on our Master Gardener website. Natasha in my, in my office made different seed templates, and this is one of the templates that you can download and print, and you can color and then use it to save your own seeds with, which is really cool. But I love Cosmos, terrific at producing seed, but also fabulous for attracting butterflies. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad you got to see him, Tia. Anne says, what is the best time of year to make stem cuttings? Well, the best time of year is during the growing season. So, Anne, I happen to know where you live. So I'm going to say for you... I'm going to say March through September, March through, yeah, March through September, but not, not late September while it's still warm, while the plant is still actively growing. Those are the best time to make stem cuttings. All right. Our next um, annual that I think is fabulous to share is Coreopsis, specifically Coreopsis Leavenworthii puts on tons of seeds and it's beautiful flowers. As you know, our state wildflower is Coreopsis. And when we, we don't we don't get specific about the um, species for our state wildflower, but I love Coreopsis leavenworthii and beautiful blooms, terrific, um, terrific variability as to where it can grow. Wants to be in the full sun, well-drained soil, can grow from zones eight to 10 and you share with seeds. So when these flowers are done, or they're ready to make seeds, the petals will fall off. And then you'll notice a little cone at the top of the flower stem. And when you crush it, it should easily fall apart in your hands. And you can see the tick like seeds because they kind of stick to you almost like a tick. And then you would, if they're plenty dry, then you could go ahead and put them in your um, seed storage bag. If you feel like they need to dry out a little bit more, I spread them out on newspaper or spread them out on a paper bag. Let them dry for a couple more days and then go ahead and bag them. And when you are saving seeds, it's a great idea to know where, what, what name it is, when you collected it, and any notes. And for me, the, a lot of the Coreopsis are very uh, variable. So some of them might have an orange center or a little bit different color or brighter or lesser yellow. And I might make a comment on that. And a neat thing to do there too, is if you're sharing it, you can put your name on there and say shared by Wendy to, you know, whoever you're sharing it to. And then my last one to share about this is Scarlet Sage, Salvia coccinea. And I can see Susan Woodruff gave me my first seeds of Salvia. And uh, she collected them from her native plant garden shared the seeds with me and I've been growing that same plant ever since. And Susan's no longer with us, but her salvia is, okay? So it's nice to be able to share those plants and share those memories. Most of you are already growing this. This is grows best in full sun, will bloom in partial shade, gets a lot taller in partial shade, wants well-drained to moist soil, and you share with seeds or seedlings. So this one seeds pretty readily, so it drops its seeds and then it pushes up. Uh, little seedlings underneath. And the hummingbirds and the butterflies, especially the sulfur, seem to really, really like this plant. Okay, these are, those are my favorite pass alongs that I wanted to share with you. I wanted to definitely make sure that you remember that there's a lot of invasive plants out there. And just because they're growing a ton doesn't mean that they are native. Um, and it, it certainly doesn't mean that they are safe to share. 
So um, my friend Kathy said she had a big patch of Mexican petunia and she said, come to my house, dig all you want, take as much as you want. And when anybody says that, that's the clue that it's a little bit of a problem, okay? And then the same thing happened to me with Boston Fern. Someone said, come to my house, dig all you want. And I'm like, oh, look at these little round tubers. They, this must be a really strong plant. Yeah, it was a really strong plant. It took me a long time to bring that out of control and get it out of my yard. And I think a lot of you know that I'm still battling my Thumbergia vine, um, Thumbergia grandiflora. So I'm, um, I'm very afraid of this plant. It's eating some of my citrus trees currently. And then the milkweed with the, um, with the puffy balls, um, gom gomphocarpus physocarpus. This is now on the invasive list as well. So you wouldn't want to share that. And of course, Sansevera is a plant that we wouldn't share. People do grow it indoors. Um, and I understand that, but as a landscape plant, that's a big no-no. Now, one of the plants that I had in my list uh, for pass along plants was the Gloriosa lily, Gloriosa superbum. Double check the IFAS assessment as I expect all of you all to do before you do a presentation also and found out that it's of high risk of invasion. So we cannot say good things about Gloriosa lily anymore. We wanna make sure that we do not promote this plant. Um, and so this remind people that it's invasive. Also our um, elephant ears, the especially um, Xanthothoma um, sagittifolium, the Calocasia taro, make sure that any of those um, elephant ear type plants, you check to know the species of to make sure that it's okay. But for the most part, know that those should not be shared. And do you know that they sell the tubers for these over in the Sam's Club <laughs> every year? Tom Wickman and I were talking about that. He's like, they're there again. And I said, I'm going to just station myself by those tubers and tell people not to purchase them. And then remember too, that um, golden ivy there off to the left Pothos, uh, the Epipremium aureum is also on the high risk of invasion plant. I know it's an interior plant, but we can't be too safe because it is eating parts of Palm Beach County. Um, we have to be super careful about that. All right, let's see what's over here. Um, and, okay. All right, Steve has a memory to share. About 30 years ago, a family friend who happened to be my third grade teacher shared some amaryllis bulbs with me. She has passed away now and it's been wonderful watching them bloom every year and remembering her. A few years ago back, I was able to share back the bulbs with her daughter who did not have any from her mom. Yeah, very similar story to my Rose story. It's beautiful. That's really nice. And... um. Uh, Basim from Osceola, uh, from Seminole County, um, he says false cardamom, which is a, a really nice a gingery plant is easy to share. Lobster flower, heliconia, papalo are also great to share with others. Thank you, Basim. And Paulette says African blue basil will grow from cuttings. Oh gosh, that's great to know, Paulette. I did not know it would grow from cuttings. I will have to try that. And she's absolutely right. African blue basil are as totally a fan favorite with the bees they love it and tia says that she shares lance leaf tick seed to the coreopsis lanceolata awesome perfect and i think that we are wrapped up i think that was my last slide yeah so thank you all for being with us uh, today i hope you enjoyed it it's kind of a little fun and I hope you learned something too. There is not going to be a Qualtrics because it's Christmas and I don't want to, uh, or the holidays, sorry, it's the holidays and I don't want to give you a little test. So happy holidays to you all. It was super fun to be with you and um, keep sharing plants with each other. I think you know how important it is just because when you share the plant, you're sharing the information too. Okay, Janice, I want some of that Okinawa spinach. That's good. All right. I hope you enjoyed it.
Oh, Allison Brown said she did her final project on sharing uh, sharing plants as a way to reduce costs and increase the fun. Yes. You all, if you want, this presentation will, is, of course, it's going to be recorded and I can put my slides up, but this would be a great, this is a great talk to give. If you want to borrow these slides and give a talk like this at your library or your civic center or your community, um, you are more than welcome to do that. All right. Thank you all. I hope you have a great rest of the holidays and we will see you in January for early ficacia and other invasives. Uh, it's going to be fun. All right. Take care, everyone. Be well.